Hey everyone, I'm Ken Chan, uh, co-founder and CTO of AVO. We're formerly known as Ribbon Finance. So AVO is a decentralized derivatives exchange where you can trade perpetuals, options, and strategies. We are backed by the best investors in the, in the space, Paradigm, Dragonfly Capital, and Coinbase Ventures. So I think before going into the topic itself, I just wanted to share my story really quick. So I am an alumni of Sunway University, and I think that just shows almost like the power of DeFi or crypto, where essentially, if you can start from somewhere like here, we can, you can actually progress in your career and go further. So I think that's like a testament of how um, great cryptocurrencies are. As a developer, if you're 14 years old, you can actually get started with a project, raise money, uh, transact permissionless, permissionlessly. So I think that's really powerful. And if you're a student in Sunway or student wherever else, I want to hear your story. I want to talk to you. Uh, I want to get you excited about the crypto space. Okay, so moving into the topic itself, the future of dApps or app chains. And um, first, a quick shill. Um, on AVO, you can trade these things. This is how our uh, face looks like. So we have a ref link here that you can use, app.avo.xyz slash r slash EFKL, and then get 10% in trading fee discounts. So why does it matter where your app actually lives? So it's important for a few reasons. You first actually have to think about where your existing users are. Do they care about cost? Like what sort of applications are they interested in? Or do they care about NFTs that exist on that chain and so forth? Next is what tech stack are you familiar with as a dev? Do you write code in Solidity? Are you familiar with EVM? Or maybe you're do something more esoteric like Rust. And last and final underappreciated point is the pumpamentals. I know this, this is not brought up a lot, but like obviously as a dev, you want to create value for the world. You want to actually gain some value yourself as a developer developing these projects. So this matters as well. So right now, what are a few choices that you can go for, right? So um, you can first create your app on an existing L1. So that's Ethereum, Avalanche, Solana. And then you can launch your own L1. This is maybe more rare, but it's happened before with Terra. And next, I think this is where we are right now, which is to deploy on an existing L2. That's Arbitrum, Optimism. And I think we are going to progress to the next stage, which is to launch your own L2 as a developer. So existing L1s, nothing special here. Next is um, launching your own L1. I think this is not explored as much. So some projects that have tried this are like Terra, DYDX with their own Cosmos chain in their V4 upgrade. So um, I, I think there's still space for exploration here. But I, I guess the alternative here is to run your own EVM chain have your own custom validator set. That is one option as well. Then you have existing L2s. You can launch on Arbitrum, Optimism, or Base. And I think the final step here and what I think DApps would be is to launch their own L2s. So that would include running on the OP stack, running on Arbitrum Orbit, and potentially StarkX. So why does this matter in the first place? Why run on an app chain? So the important part about an app chain or an L2 is we inherit security from Ethereum itself. I think that's very underappreciated. And then you have some control over network parameters as an application developer, which you don't normally do on an L2 or L1. And you get a familiar tech stack with EVM and Solidity if you're developing on all these EVM L2s.
So first thing, security guarantees. If you are running your own L1, we've seen issues with this before, you have to actually bootstrap your own validator set. And the problem with that is that it takes huge effort in building the culture around running a validator, getting groups interested in running and maintaining it consistently. So I think it's difficult in general. And so the next part is that your tokens market cap is essentially your security budget almost. So um, if it takes 100K to 51% attack your network, then really you are in huge trouble. And so this quote from Vitalik here, if the price of Ether is at zero, then your network cannot be secure. This is true both in proof of stake and proof of work. And so we've seen issues like that happen with Terra before where essentially the price of Terra traded down to zero and then it suddenly cost like 50 bucks to attack Terra. So that's not great. They had to restart and halt the network. And so I don't think this is the path you want to actually venture down as an app developer. Right, next thing is pumpamentals. I think the issue we have with having an L1 token to be tied to your dApp is that it's only tangential to your dApp. So you've seen issues like that with Luna token and UST. You would have UST be backed by Luna in some way. And I think that's not great because you suddenly have to care about your security of your L1 and your stable coin. So the problem with L1 security is that you have to inflate your tokens or issue or print new tokens to give to validators. That gets quite expensive, right? You get your tokens dumped by these validators if they are not long-term holders. And then, uh, what, what is it for, really? It's just to incentivize people to run computers to validate your chain. But really, if you are, let's say, derivatives exchange like AVO, we would rather prefer actually giving that token out to incentivize liquidity or to incentivize traders. So the other interesting point in running your own L2 is that you get to collect sequence of fees. Sequence of fees is the excess between what users pay on your L2 versus what is paid on Ethereum. So you collect that excess there and that becomes essentially protocol revenue for your DAO. Right. One important part as a developer is to co control your availability and your bandwidth, right? With an L2 or an L1, when a meme coin or an NFT drop happens, you don't actually have control over that. So one example is like Basie when they launched a land drop. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Ethereum got really congested. Gas was at like 500 GUE or something. And the network was essentially unusable, right? So that's something important to consider because we want the network to always be available and not have any variability in gas pricing. Then the other important part is to have customized withdrawal periods. Um, the issue with Arbitrum and Optimism right now is that you have this fixed seven day withdrawal period, which I think is unreasonable if you run an exchange or an application because users essentially have to wait seven days to get their funds out. I think the analogy here is that running your own L2 is running your own dedicated server almost, this diagram here. So if you are running on an existing L1 or L2, you are sharing bandwidth with other uh, users and dApps on that network. It's not a perfect analogy, but I think this is the right model to think about it. This tech stack familiarity. So if you write Solidity code, you're familiar with the EVM, it's perfect for you. So you don't actually have to pick up something esoteric like Cairo or Rust and so on. But if you are interested in writing Rust or C++, uh, Arbitrum Stylus actually offers you that ability. So if you're a D app developer, join the future. It's a very bright one with app chains. So we have Zora, Avo, that is uh, leading a way around developing uh, L2s that are specific for an application. So 
as a dev developer, you then have to think about what stack do you use? What data availability solution do you use? Shared sequencing. And if you are going to sign up to these rollups as a service. So data availability solution just, just means where you want to post these call data or state proofs to. So right now, by default, Optimism and Arbitrum post them to Ethereum. So it gets quite expensive still to transact on Arbitrum and Optimism. This is a very simplified diagram. So right now, each rollup run on their own. And then if you have something like shared sequencing, you can actually do cross-chain interactions between the two rollups. So maybe you have meme coin A, you, you want to swap it into meme coin B that only exists on another rollup. You can actually do so with shared sequencing. So which stack do you use? I think the most common one right now is the OP stack. It's forked a lot at this point, so it's very well understood. And then you have Arbitrum Orbit and StarkX as other stacks that you can adopt as well. And data availability solutions. So Ethereum is the default right now for Arbitrum and Optimism. So that's what people are sticking to. And then you can consider other upcoming solutions like Astria and EigenDA. Shared sequencing, this is what I mentioned before where you can do cross roll-up interactions. You can either sign up for the OP superchain. So superchain initiative is when any uh, roll-ups that use the OP stack, they can interact with each other in the superchain. Next is Espresso and Astria. Um, these are shared sequencing services which um, the apps can actually s sign up for. Then finally, if you want to go hardcore, you would run the rollup yourself, but I don't highly recommend you do that. I think it's quite difficult because these providers actually solve a lot of the complexity around security and maintaining the nodes for you. So you have Conduit and Caldera to pick from. This is how Avo's tech stack looks like so far. So you have Ethereum, which we are posting call data to. That's our data availability solution. Then we run on the OP stack, and then we have uh, Conduit as our service provider to actually run the rollup itself. Right, so thank you. I think, I ho hopefully that was a quick one. If you have any questions, do let me know. And yeah, sign up for Avo and use this rep link. Awesome, thank you very much, Ken. All right, we'll open it up for Q&A. We've got some time for Q&A. Anybody got some questions, please uh, raise your hand and I'll pass you a microphone. Incidentally, what did you study at Sunway? Computer science. Okay, I was a lecturer at Sunway actually a long time ago. I used to teach psychology. Okay, anybody got a question? Please raise your hand and I'll pass you a microphone. Okay, oh, oh very quiet today. Maybe I should do a session about the benefits of using a CEX. Mm. <laughs> That'll be fun. <laughs> it's going to be a panel, right? Yeah. Uh, when did you graduate from Sunway? Was it recently? It was 2019. 19, okay. Yeah. Wow. Cool, huh? Amazing what Sunway can do. <laughs> I'm kidding. Amazing what you can do. Um, okay. Any questions about decentralized trading using OP stack? Is anybody here building on optimism using OP stack? Raise your hand if you are. Yes. Oh, you have a question to ask? Yes, you do. Fantastic. I'm going to come and pass you the microphone. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Please introduce your name and ask him a tough question, okay? Kidding. Ask any question. Um, wow, well, I'm actually really curious. Oh, sorry. Introduce myself. Uh, my name is Shan. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm not a very tech person, so I guess uh, it would be really helpful if you could uh, share a little bit about as someone who's new to trading, right? Like how can we use um, AVO? Um, I'm not asking for financial advice, <laughs> but along those lines. Sure. So um, on the AVO, I think we want to bring centralized exchange experience to a uh, decentralized exchange. So here you can actually trade perpetual futures, which are leverage uh, futures, which you can trade on up to 20x. 
And then you can trade on options as well if you are an options expert. Okay, hope that answers your question and helps you generate generational wealth. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, okay, hold on, I'll pass it through here. There you go, introduce your name please and your question, thank you. Yeah, hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Ryan. Um, I'm a convert from TradFi to DeFi. So I was just going to ask you a question earlier uh, when you were on a DeFi panel, but I think since you're talking about DEX, um, two-part question, very simple. Um, first is, do you think financial inclusion is the primary aim of DeFi or, or DEX? And secondly, if you think it's yes, um, how do you think you can reconcile the regulation with financial inclusion if you're going that way? Because I think you were a bit of a pro-regulation when you were in a panel earlier. <laughs> yeah, I think there are almost like two streams of thought to this. So it, when Ethereum started, uh, people almost treated Ethereum almost like this private bank that's decentralized. You will have people ha have huge USDC balances and then essentially you, they are okay with paying like $100 per transaction, which, you know, it's a private bank, so it's fine. So with, with financial inclusion, I think we can really see that with like the new L2s that are coming up with Arbitrum and Optimism. So yeah, I'm very much in favor of that. So on AVO, we have this deposit method where you are able to deposit from Arbitrum and Optimism. So I think, yeah, that's a huge point. And as for the second part of the question, I think... Mm, I don't think we are going to implement. Okay, I, 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 let, mm -hmm, let me good luck. That. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think AYC will happen if you grow large enough, and I don't think we are large enough to do that yet. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think you still have to conform to some form of regulation to do financial inclusion, as you mentioned. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the question. Thank you for the honest answer as well. Um, if no further questions, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a lunch break. Let's give our speaker, Ken, another big round of applause. Thank you very much, Ken.